Good afternoon. Thank you for being here today. We're really excited about the next session. It was so unpopular, in fact, that we had to move it to a bigger room. So thanks for finding it. Um, really quick, a housekeeping item. We are going to be a what, having a What You Need to Know session in Salon C downstairs at 6.30. So if this is your first time to South by Southwest, definitely tip, check that out for tips and suggestions for the rest of the event. And now please join me in welcoming to the stage for the session, Alex Hardiman, Brian Stelter, Sarah Fisher, and Steve Rosenbaum. Greetings. We are going to answer all the complicated questions about the future of the news business today. <laughs> it's going to, we're going to be done in 30 minutes. Just Perfect. Put a on it. Yeah. To the bars. Uh, um, we have a fabulous panel. They've been very generous with their time. Uh, Brian Stelter from CNN, uh, Sarah Fisher from Axios, and Alex Hardiman from Facebook. I hate at panels like this when people give 25-minute intros of who they are. So I decided I would do it for them. Really quick, and then we can get to the, to the conversation. So Sarah told me that she started in ad sales and thought she was going to be a CRO and now is the media reporter at Axios, which, by the way, makes it a fabulous, strange journey, but a perfect panelist for this. Mm. So thank you very much. Um, so Brian, I'm going to call you something you don't call yourself. What's that? I think you're a news entrepreneur. That's a, that's a high compliment, thank you. Well, it, but complicated because you began with your own news product in college, then you went to CNN where you were, uh, uh, went to the New York Times where you were a, a mentor and protege of the D David Carr for a long time and, and said famously that you would never leave for television and then you left for television. Um, uh, and now you're at CNN. But what's interesting, and we'll talk about it in the panel is, you produce a lot of different news products, yeah. not just cable television. Yeah. And then, last but not least, Alex, uh, also a New York Times alum. Um, so if you're starting to see a theme here, that they all have history back to the New York Times, there is some clue about that, and we'll get to maybe what it is. Um, but you were at the Times for a long time, 10 years. Um, and, and explain ten, the Times as a had a pro did product management, like what, what was your role? Oh yeah, I oversaw news products at the Times, uh, starting mainly with mobile um, and really helping see the shift from desktop to mobile through across product, uh, news initiatives, revenue, et cetera. And then I oversaw news products when we went across platform. So I have a lot of friends that have worked at the Times. Yeah. Um, I hear it's a very intense place, so you just needed a little bit more of a mellow place to go. <laughs> totally. <laughs> you just decided. I mean, what I actually, my story's a little weird. I actually left the New York Times to leave media. I went to Facebook for a hot second before the elections uh, to lead a pages team focused on small business transactional tools for micro sellers in APAC and Latin America. Um, the election and some other events happened, and I quickly went back into news. So. Uh, and let me introduce myself. My name is Steve Rosenbaum. Uh, I'm the host of Future Forward, which is a podcast. Uh, I've written a bunch of books, uh, and I'm a filmmaker, and uh, a lifelong uh, creator and launcher of companies in the news business. So I, I want to start um, with a, a little bit of an alternate history question for all of you. And then some of these questions are for individuals, and some of them we'll make up as we go along. Um, if you could go back in time, and the world were a different place, and Mark Zuckerberg decided that he was going to follow his father's footsteps into dentistry, <laughs> and Facebook didn't exist. Would publishers be in virtually the same place they are today, or a dramatically different place? Did that piece of history really change the trajectory of publishers? And I'll let you go last. <laughs> OK. Uh, Sarah. I think that publishers, for a long time, were slow to adapt to digital. And thus, a lot of the headwinds that they're facing aren't necessarily because of Facebook, although there are some that have been expedited because there is this platform. But it's because many of them didn't see uh, the tide turning quick enough. And we're starting to see now publishers adapting to mobile, now publishers adapting to a fast speed internet, when in reality, some of them should have been looking at this years ago. So I think that Facebook in some ways may have expedited it, but there's always going to be innovation and technology. There are other platforms, there are Googles, there are Twitters. Um, but I also think that publishers have some responsibility too to adapt to the changing times. I, I would say that if Facebook had not been invented, 
a newsroom or a media company could have invented it instead, or something like it instead. And, and I know that's wishful thinking now to look back more than a decade later, uh, but media companies could have and should have been inventing Facebooks, several of them, many of them. And they could have invented Craigslist the while they were at it. And, and Craigslist while they were at it, but, but truly, there, there were a lot of missed opportunities, and I know that we want to look forward today and not talk only about the past, but uh, I do think uh, if, th if that's the case from 15 years ago, what's true today is that newsrooms and media companies should be making Facebook killers or making Facebook alternatives, making the next app, making the next social network or whatever it's going to be. Uh, so maybe we can learn from those lessons from history. Uh, if Facebook hadn't existed, something else would have, and certainly publishers would still be contending with Google and with other, uh, other monopolistic companies that are sucking up advertising revenue. But it is a worthwhile thought experiment, I think, because you'll wonder who could have made it instead, who could have built it instead, and what would that business model would have looked like? What would the structure have looked like that could have been more advantageous for the publishers? Alex, assuming that I'm going to get my teeth cleaned by Dr. Zuckerberg. <laughs> <laughs> so, so let's say dental school is his passion. Um, I, I actually, I agree with Sarah. I think that Facebook did not create the levers that actually helped disrupt the news industry, but I do think that Facebook did accelerate many of them. Like if we go back to some of the milestones that she pointed out, the rise of mobile, even the shift to cable before that, with the internet, the rise of personal computing, I mean, all of these things were happening regardless in terms of how people were, dis how information was being distributed and how people were accessing it. Facebook did, though, help in the acceleration of the distribution, and for that, we definitely have a responsibility. And I think we'll talk a lot more about what we're doing in terms of taking that responsibility seriously and how we're really pivoting towards a world where we want high quality news to succeed. Um, I think the business model piece is also really interesting. Uh, you guys mentioned Craigslist. I mean, the classified business entirely eroding happened with Craigslist. We then saw eBay as a fast follow. It happened in the real estate vertical with yep. uh, Zillow and with Redfin. I mean, these things really helped create the commercial web. We saw the unbundling of publisher content, which helped erode the ad market. And now, though, we're seeing this really interesting shift where the rebundling of content is happening. Digital subscription models are thriving. It's actually something that I'm particularly thrilled to see happen. And it's something that, again, as we think about our future responsibility for Facebook, we are doing as much as we can to help those succeed. So I don't think Facebook is the reason for those shifts happening, but I do recognize, and we recognize that we helped accelerate some of them, and we now have a, a real responsibility. So in the, this panel's uh, title, we use the word publisher. Yep. So I, I want to ask all of you to just spend a little bit of a moment and think about that word and what it means. And just by way of example, I would say, you know, when I list these institutions, you tell me if they all fit your model of publisher. New York Times, BuzzFeed, Infowars. Now, it's not meant to be a trick question, and the easy answer is yes, they're all publishers, but are, you know, does Infowars fit into the same bundle as the New York Times, and if not? Well, well they're not all news publishers. They, they, Infowars is a publisher, but not a news publisher. I wonder if Alex Jones would agree with that, but go ahead. I, I don't yeah. care if Alex yeah. Jones. <laughs> Agrees with that, um, but but you know, they're, they're, I think the language around the word news is important here. Okay. And uh, around real news is much of talk about fake news or false news. That term has been so uh, exploited by the president that it's better, I think, to talk about what is what is real news if if there's something that's not. What's real news? And certainly there are many many publishers that are producing news or entertainment uh, that I think would go into the bucket that we're here talking about today. Would you like to hear my opinion on? on? But, yeah. Okay. Uh, so I, I think for us, we historically within Facebook did not necessarily distinguish between different types of news. And that was problematic. Flattening the news meant that you couldn't always tell the difference between something that was trusted, informative, credible versus something that might be a little bit more fraudulent. Now we have a very explicit stand where we're really trying to figure out how to define quality and make sure that we are explicitly raising that in terms of what people see and making sure that we can create sustainable business models for high quality publishers. And so if I think about the examples, I would say, okay, do we have any proof that what InfoWars is doing is broadly trusted by a large, diverse set of people? Is it informative? I mean, are, is it credible? If yes, then you could argue that those are the types of attributes that would warrant it being more present in newsfeed and more broadly across the internet. If it's not, if it uses tactics like misinformation, uh, 
spreading viral hoaxes, clickbait sensational stuff, that's what we are deliberately deprioritizing right now. And so for us, that's how we're trying to segment the world as opposed to taking a per domain definition of deciding what is or isn't news. So um, here, it's a more objective, incredible way, I believe. And so, it's a, we have to make sure we don't game the system so, so and that the, other people can't game the system. So we have a lot of- So here's the bell that that sets yeah. off for me, though. Yeah. When, when you try and look at analytically, so, so here, here's a harder one. Infowars was a gimme. Yeah. But, but, but let's put Fox News in the mix. Yeah. There are people who believe it's broadly trusted. There's a large number of people. It's a very popular cable network. And they would tell you, you know, I think based on that set of, of, of signals, you know, Fox News would come in as an accurate, trusted news source. Brian, is that, I mean? Fox News is a news source. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't think anyone would disagree with that. I, I think also, if you want to look like Yale recently took the broadly trusted methodology that we've been employing, and they replicated it. And they did find that even like a news organization like Fox News does have broadly trusted signals coming from people with very different ideo ideological beliefs. So I don't think it's crazy to think of Fox as a news source. I, what I would say about Fox is it just really, it's, it's two things in one. It's an opinion channel and a news channel. Right, right. They awkwardly coexist together. Uh, and I think one of, the, one of the improvements that Facebook I've seen that I've appreciated recently is this little uh, circle with a question mark on some of the articles, some of the news articles that are posted, to let you see more about who is this publisher, wh where do they come from, uh, what is their bent. That's not perfect, but it's a step in the right direction so that if you're in this crowd and for some reason don't know what Fox News is, it has some data to give you a little bit of a sense of, of what it is. I, no, no, thank you for calling that out. I mean, we are at step 0.1 in the journey, but I think helping people from a news literacy perspective have access to information to distinguish between news and analysis versus opinion, for instance, to understand the ownership structure, whether or not a news organization has a fact-checking policy, an ethics policy, these are really important signals. And we're working with third parties like the Trust Project to make sure that we can pull this in and that people can help make really smart decisions about what to read, what to comment on, what to share with their friends and family. Um, we have to do as much as we can to really differentiate different types of news and make sure that quality thrives. So, in a year, Facebook went from, we didn't have anything to do with the election, that's ridiculous, which was the original, to, I, I think, a, a pretty public statement on Mark's part, that actually, you know what, we've taken a hard look at it, we've seen the data, we have to actually really fix it. That was, a, I mean, that's, that's not a, that wasn't a little journey he took. That was a, a big journey and has been pretty impactful, I assume, on your sleep habits and, you know, <laughs> you know uh, there was an article in The Atlantic about a, a survey, which I hadn't seen, but you had, about, that essentially said bad news, fake news is shared much more widely than accurate news, and that's not a Facebook problem. Like, yeah, like, to be fair, that was a study of Twitter. It was a, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but yes. yes. But, but it was this, so is, is this really a losing battle we're fighting? Is it really, are, are we going to solve it? I, I don't think it it's was a, Twitter. Do, I don't think it's a losing battle, but I think it's a really hard one. I mean, even if we, you know, I'm going to be a little hard on Facebook right now. If we look at what Facebook traditionally rewarded in newsfeed, it was information that played well around raw engagement and clicks. And the stuff that does well tends to be emotionally charged, polarizing, divisive. These are deep problems. So this is why it has been a year of deep reflection. Mark came out and really talked about his year of 2018 being about fixing Facebook. And it starts with actually, in many ways, reducing time spent so that the time that people spend is really well spent. And that means that we are going to be prioritizing or deprioritizing news that might have actually increased time spent because it has the properties of being more sensationalist and more emotionally divisive in favor of high quality news. And that's a really, really big shift. And I think anyone who's watched Mark take a stand in terms of his annual priority. I mean, think about when he decided the company was going mobile first. He is pouring investments in. I am gold on it. All teams are gold on their ability to really make sure that integrity issues are fixed to the best possible extent and that from a news perspective, we're really elevating quality. News that is trusted, local, informative, and really stuff that you can trust. So I'm gonna switch back to this publisher question for a second. So Sarah, talk about your role. The daily newsletter, when, when does it come out? How does it get written? How many people work on it? Do you have a team of 30 people? So he's smiling. So uh, well, I'd say my team is my entire uh, company yep. because there's not a single product that ever is made by one individual. And 
Every single person from our ad ops team to our executive editors helps inform what I write about. Uh, it comes out once a week every Tuesday. It's about media. Um, but I'd say just taking a step back from Axios and back from me, one of the things that we've learned in dealing with platforms like Facebook or Google or Twitter is that they've done a really good job of creating products that can serve consumers really well, where they are on their phone in real time, no latency problems. And we as publishers recognize that with newsletters, we can actually get to our consumers in a very similar, efficient way. And that's why we've decided to allocate a lot of resources to them. Um, going back to your question about what is considered a publisher, though, one of the things that I thought was so interesting is that it used to be that only media companies, for the most part, were making ad revenue. And now, like Kroger as a grocer, is creating an ad network. Almost any company that has captivated time and attention can make money off of your time and attention. And this has been the great change, I think, of the 21st century in publishing. Brian, I want to talk about your editorial output. So uh, I said to you in the green room, you know, I quote, watch your show every week, except I don't. I listen to it as a podcast. Um, I read your newsletter every day, although I'm, I'm somewhat baffled by the volume of things you produce. But let me, let me start with an easy question. When okay. CNN offered you the job, did they say, we want you to do a weekly television show and a second podcast and a daily newsletter, or was that your idea? Uh, no, it, it was originally a two-legged stool. It was a show on Sunday and write stories for the website. Uh, and it's become a four-legged stool. And I, I launched the newsletter because, uh, I mean, do you want to, I mean can, I be, can I be honest? <laughs> I, I, I wanted to do the newsletter because lots of people would say to me, Brian, I, do you miss writing stories for the New York Times? And I would say, I write stories every day for CNN. Uh, you know, look at this website. This website has thousands of stories on CNN.com. Uh, but I understand the New York Times has a certain prestige people associate with it. Uh, the newsletter was a way for me to send my stories to everybody, right? To get in inboxes. And increasingly, I think a lot of us in this crowd are feeling that those sorts of old-fashioned delivery systems uh, have a lot of use. When we feel overwhelmed and exhausted by the news cycle, when we have a headache from, from watching everything that's happening in the world, uh, I think something that's more digestible and is delivered to you has a lot of appeal. And that's, that's why I love Sarah's. It's why uh, we, we have the reliable newsletter. Um, it's, it's a way to try to digest what's going on. And look, we're, we're looking at these mega trends that are happening in this industry. We're talking about one of them today, Facebook and publishers. You, you touched on another one, disinformation. It's going to get worse before it gets better. And or, or it's going to get worse until it keeps getting worse. Or, or, or until it keeps yeah. getting worse. And to the extent that we can uh, create trusted relationships with our audience in a, in a much more personal way, uh, that feels like at least one small part of the solution. I, I, I don't know if you answered this question or not, but how many subscribers does it, how many do you send out? I only care about one subscriber, and that's my wife. As long as she liked the newsletter last night, it's good. Right. I'll leave it at that. All right. Um, talk about Facebook. How do you use it? You communicate on it when your show's live. You go on and say, how am I doing? Right. Yeah, I mean, I use it like an amateur. I use it like a lot of people. I'm overwhelmed by Facebook these days. I don't know what Facebook is anymore. I know what it started as. I know what I used it for in college. I don't know what to do with it these days. And uh, I'm, I'm fascinated by the evolution we've seen in the past year. You know, the way that you talk about trust and quality, Alec, it, it's extraordinary how far Facebook's come in the past couple of years in the way it talks about news and talks about uh, quality in, in the news feed. I think a lot of us think the company has a long way to still go, to walk the walk, but the talk has changed, and we're seeing some very uh, clear attempts at improving what's on Facebook. So you said something, you just said, you know, I use it as an amateur. Yeah, I, I don't know how to, I mean, yeah. Well, I, well, but, but I'll tell you, as, a, as an audience member, <laughs> I find it incredibly, if you're talking about building connections with your audience, yeah. Being able to say, hey, how are we doing, or give me feedback, or what ideas should we, like, that's, that's, a, that's a new journalism idea. I, I mean, don't think it's new anymore. You think it's still new? I, I, I think for a decade we've been using Facebook and Twitter to engage the public. But not in an interactive, more, mm. not tell me how I'm doing. I see. I mean, well, the old media model is, we're going to do what we do, and if you don't like it, change the channel. Sure. Right? And, and, and that has to be gone and, and, right. and over. But I would say, though, the, the Facebook tweak that I appreciated most this year, of all the things Facebook's done recently, uh, now when you delete a comment, you can also block that person at the same time. And, and to be honest, given the toxicity of, of social media right now, the amount of hate and trolling that's going on, just that little change has 
huge effects on people's lives to be able to actually block the people that are attacking. Not just journalists, who cares about that, but, but about individual users on the site who feel like they're being attacked. So some of this is happening in a generational way. And I, 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 I heard something the other day that surprised me, and I want to just talk about whether or not, you know, we're a generation of news consumers. So you did an interview with David Hogue, the Parkland survivor. Yeah, right. And you said to him, you're getting all this hateful YouTube, all this social media hateful stuff. Right. Don't you want it to stop? And he said, no. I'm thankful for it. Yeah. He said, I'm thankful but, for it. But you it. seem like it kind of caught, like it caught you a little, like you were expecting that he was going to say, yeah, we have to, like he's not part of this whole stop the bad social media thing. Yeah, he has much thicker skin than I do or that I think many of us do. He was saying he was grateful for their uh, attacks and it, because it was giving him even more attention, drawing even more attention <laughs> like, to his cause. It was somehow kryptonite. It's like, it, right. like, yeah, no, it was, he was using it as power. And it made me think that all of our conversations about how to stop it, like there might be, you know, if you talk to younger consumers, they'd say, stop what? We just, mm. we listen, you know, it's all noise. Well, mm. I also think too, we come at it from adults. And we are adults that want to look at creating a safe environment for our kids. And sometimes kids look at platforms and they see this as being a mode of expression and a mode of connectivity. And now one of the things that we're recognizing is that they might not even understand some of the dangers that they're being exposed to, whether it's data privacy, whether it's cyberbullying, it could be addiction. Um, these are really important issues. There are a lot of issues that Facebook is trying to address. I attended Facebook Safety Summit last week, and this is all we talked about, suicide with kids on Facebook. And so I think there are a lot of students like David Hogue who see this as being an incredibly powerful platform, and it is. But with that comes incredible responsibility, and that's the thing that we are at the crosshairs of right now. How do we regulate innovation so that we can create a safe community, so that we can have a net positive effect on democracy? And quite frankly, Facebook is at the center of many of those conversations. So, so some of this comes down to authenticity. And I remember the first time that someone forwarded your newsletter to me, I looked at the from address and it was your email address. And I thought, well, that's a mistake. She didn't mean to do that. Like, you don't want to be getting all that weird noise you're going to get back from crazy people. Yes, I do. Right? And the answer yeah. is, right? I absolutely so, do. Right? So, so talk about your relationship with your readers and how that's different than, for example, at the Times. Uh, well, it's different at the Times because at the Times I was in ad sales. Uh, so I didn't get direct um, replies from, like, mass amounts of people. It was more so just clients. But at Axios, if you get an email newsletter from somebody and you hit reply, it does go directly to the author of that newsletter. And I do feel it's my responsibility to address you. Whether or not you have a problem with the content that I'm producing, if you have a question, if you want to connect with me, these times are changing so fast, particularly in media, that it's my responsibility to view every single person as a source. It doesn't matter if you're six years old and you're looking at an iPhone for the first time, if you're 86 years old and you're logging onto Facebook for the first time, Everyone's value, everyone's input is valuable because it's changing so fast and it's different for everyone. So we've tried to create a system in which we can be really responsive reporters, we can engage with our audiences. Sometimes it's overwhelming, uh, but at the same time, it's so worth it and it's part of what makes our jobs fun. I mean, we've even seen um, the use of groups as a really like creative way where a lot of journalists are getting in touch directly with readers or even like the Boston Globe has a subscriber only group where subscribers and journalists can engage in really interesting debates close to subscribe and it's a really wonderful retention tool as well but it makes the humanity behind the incredible journalism really shine and these are the types of things that we need to help create more opportunity for. We really want good news to feel differentiated and so with the voices behind the coverage I think that's one of the most interesting areas for us to do some, some pretty cool stuff. So I want to drill into some Facebook product stuff, things sure. that you've tried, things that have worked. But let's start, just explain your job. Like, my, my job. The, <laughs> that's exactly what I right? said yeah. 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 The, the title is yeah. Head of News Product. Right. What does yeah. that mean? Yeah, so, so practically it means I oversee um, the product and the engineering teams. Uh, responsible for a few discrete news products, um, products like news format, so instant articles, uh, local news. We have a big investment recently where we've created a new dedicated space for local news uh, in six markets that we're testing right now. 
um, a lot of work on credibility. So the, thing, the weird thing about Facebook is that you sometimes own very clear products, and then other, in other ways you own almost like a layer that you need to integrate across other surfaces or parts of Facebook. And credibility is one of them. So I really work with uh, a lot of internal teams like Newsfeed to make sure that any signals of quality can be applied to really good news. Um, I work on a news ranking team. So a lot of what we've recently announced, the changes to make sure that we can identify and promote quality news and feed, requires a lot of different methods. And so we really try to identify and uprank uh, good stuff. And then we also have monetization, which is obviously incredibly important for publishers. And we not only look at advertising, but also subscriptions is one of the really big investments for us. Uh, we want to make sure that we can create great moments for the business models that tend to help quality journalism thrive. And from there, there are a lot of op other opportunities, uh, registration models, membership models. We're actually really excited about extending this platform. We know there's not one size fits all, and we think there's a lot of great work we can do this year. So let's talk about the, the news tab experiment. So we didn't see it in the US, and I, there may have been some screen explore. grabs. Explore? What? Yeah, explore. explore the yeah, the right. second tab? Yeah. yeah. So that came and went. Yep. And so that means that experiment didn't succeed. Correct. What were, the, what were the things you were measuring that made you decide it didn't work? Yeah, I mean, the, Facebook experiments a lot. I would argue that for this experiment, we probably didn't communicate intent uh, very clearly up front. But the key thesis was whether or not people would find it more valuable, um, sort of similar to Snapchat, to have your friends and family content in one space and your public content from the pages you follow and news organizations in a second space. And we tested it out and we heard overwhelmingly from people that they did not prefer that world. They wanted everything to be directly within newsfeed. The idea of combining personal and public content was the thing that actually helped them get better time spent with Facebook. Um, and so we, we heard loud and clear and then we disabled the experiment. So this is the question that I always have wanted to ask Facebook. Okay. So if I'm the customer yeah. and I'm a news junkie and I like Brian's stuff and I like a bunch of, I like Sarah, and I, why, what, why would it not be a better product with a slider that says more of that or less of that? What, like, why is it every change is going to come from the top down and be delivered across all of the customers? Yeah, so I think consumer control is actually one of the big um, areas for us to invest this year. There are some controls that you yes. have where you can decide what you want to see first, um, but I think there's a lot more that we can do. There are a lot of preferences. This definitely caters more to a power user. Um, I mean, all of us, we probably see a lot more news in our news feed than the average person, um, and so we're definitely not the majority use case. Um, but for anyone, they should have better access and control to what they see when they see it. Um, we're, we're working through a lot of interesting ideas. It's two billion? Over two billion monthly uh, actives. You know, I just think about what kind of a restaurant I would run if I had to serve <laughs> meals to two billion people. Because taste's really different around the world. I, I agree. I mean, that is what, uh, one of the things that keeps me up at night is making sure that we are building products that scale and preserve diversity. And that means a lot of things. Um, it means scaling to different types of news organizations. So traditional, digital first, large, local. Um, making sure that internationally we have solutions that are either regionally specific or sometimes broad and can scale at the platform level. Um, it's, it's legitimately tough, um, but that's why we need to be very, very thoughtful about how we define quality and build products that do work uh, in all of these different contexts. So I'm going to ask all of you to think about this. So if what Facebook's doing is dialing back what, what you define as public content, right, and increasing private, isn't it? Friends and family, yeah. So, so is the good news that publishers have been using Facebook as an enabler and not building their own direct audiences, and now other publishers are going to have to learn what Axios knows and what Brian knows and start being more authentic and communicating and connecting and getting people to come and click on their, you know, it, essentially is Facebook backing, backing off and is that going to wake up publishers or is it just going to damage them? I think it's a huge wake-up call and a huge opportunity. I think a lot of publishers that relied on platforms for traffic distribution and those relationships are waking up to a new reality, which is that you can't shortcut your audience. You need to be there directly, and you need to be reaching them directly. Um, but I also think that it's a it's an opportunity for publishers to start to think about quality of content in a different way. One of the things that Alex had mentioned is that Facebook's newsfeed platform, even just a year ago, was really reliant on clicks. And it's a false sense of engagement, which is one thing that I think Facebook has identified. Clicks don't necessarily mean that people uh, want to understand your brand better. Clicks can be gamed. Clicks can be fake. 
Um, and I think that now publishers are realizing those clickbait headlines, those clickbait kind of content, it didn't serve them well to build an audience off of, and it's forcing them to be better. So yeah. you're, not a, you're not sympathetic. I got a bunch of emails when people knew I was moderating this panel about little things that and you know, and we just we just wrote a story the other day. Cox's uh, conservative network, Rare, also you know went out of business and might be in large part due to the Facebook algorithm. I think one thing to think about in sympathy is that you have executives. Campbell Brown, the head of Facebook's uh, journalism project, said this the other day, which is that Facebook could have been more transparent around experiments and tests. And I think this is where the sympathy for me does lie. If you were a publisher that was relying on Facebook. You want it to be communicated with, uh, to know when changes were happening, to know if you were investing in a test or an experiment, what the return was. And I think Facebook has really learned from some of the feedback from publishers and is trying to now be a little bit more vocal about when they're testing with publishers so that publishers don't put all their eggs in one basket only to find that things aren't going to be working out. Um, but at the end of the day, too, you don't want to reveal too much about your tests, I would assume, because then it could allow people to, like, get overly excited about it or game it. I don't know. Yeah. But, by the way, yeah, can but I, can I just the... add a couple of things really fast? Just because I, I just want to, I think you're right. I just want to clarify a few things. One is that this is the year where, as Campbell and others have said, we are redefining our relationship with publishers because we have not been as explicit as we need to be. And so that means that we are coming out with a clear stand where we are supporting quality news. We're not backing away from news. There is going to be less news in feed, but the news people see needs to be significantly better. And with that, that means that some publishers might decide that they don't necessarily want to work with Facebook. It is their call, but we do think that we can be one part of a larger strategy for a lot of publishers. But I think that all eggs in one basket moment is gone. Second, I think that you know you pull up an example like Little Things or other publishers who are saying that these recent ranking changes are the reason why they're going out of business. I just actually don't think that that's true. I think that when we look at the publishers who are not doing well, most likely it's because they are abusing the system in certain ways. Their content might be sensationalist, it might be misleading, they could be triggering ad farm warnings. There's a reason for certain publishers when they don't do well on Facebook, and so just be a little bit careful about the public narrative that one recent ranking change is the reason why they're gone. That's just not the case. I think one of the issues is that there are a series of uh, moments where publishers either are told one thing or they, they interpret something. Uh, uh, go, go into live video, do Facebook Live. Uh, uh, maybe not so much anymore, actually. It, it's zig and zag and zig and zag from, from one idea to the other, from the one experiment to the next. And some of these are just silly. I, I saw you all came out recently and said, we're going to put more breaking news stories in the feed. When people see the tab breaking news, it turns out it's 7% more pop. It's like, give me a break. Everyone who's ever watched cable news knows that breaking news will get people's attention. And I feel like sometimes you all act like you're discovering things about the news business for the first time. I, 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 that's my, no. that's my concern. I, yeah. I, I'll be honest, I find that to be kind of patronizing. Um, I think that... Well, you are new to the news business, after all. I, well, <laughs> so, so first, we are really bringing in a lot of news expertise because we know we have some problems to solve. I think the idea that making breaking news a high-quality, trusted experience on Facebook is not worth investing in is kind of crazy. So we are taking a stand where we think that working at this point with over 70 high-quality publishers with very clear processes and guidelines in place to make sure that they are not abusing the system and putting breaking news on every single post, but that when breaking news is actually happening, publishers have a way to signal that in newsfeed is really important. So I would push back politely, but also firmly. I think that that's actually not a very fair statement. When I hear you say investing, though, here, here's how it comes across sometimes to me. We're going to throw $3 million at these poor, suffering regional newsrooms that need subscriptions. We're going to throw a little money at trying to improve breaking news. But Facebook made $3.9 billion one quarter, and then $4.7 billion the next quarter, and then $4.3 billion the most recent quarter, and it feels like y'all are just throwing a quarter out the window to the poor person on the side of the road sometimes. Right. The, the, the idea that Facebook has this responsibility, having gobbled up billions of advertising revenue from a lot of different places, uh, Shouldn't we have a bigger conversation about Facebook paying more directly for some of the journalism well, that's out there? Some of the so, quality so, journalism that you all want to see? So let me, let me, a couple of things. I don't have the answer, yeah. but can we talk about that? I, I, I think we should absolutely be talking about these things. Listen, as we are making the shift to quality, everything is on the table. We are having very active conversations with 
a lot of publishers, with a lot of academics, with a lot of experts in the space. I don't Look, have I'm an announcement. I'm not asking you to get your checkbook out today. No, I'm saying, I, oh, I'm saying I don't have an announcement to make. Yeah. But I just think that I want to better contextualize some of the good work that we really are trying to pilot to better understand how we can help create sustainable business models on Facebook. So, so you mentioned, just really fast, you mentioned a $3 million investment. That's a local subscription accelerator with 12 publishers. And it's meant to help identify and solve for problems unique to their businesses so that they have a sustainable way to generate subscriptions on or off Facebook. Right. It's not about peddling Facebook products. It's about making sure that we can come up with best practices with LenFest Institute, with the News Media Alliance, with a bunch of others that we can then help share across local news organizations. If this works, you can imagine applying it to a lot of other problems that we need to solve. Right, and so to be clear, wait, 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 I'm hold. rooting for, I'm rooting for wait, you. Wait, 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 but I want to understand that product because yeah. it's, I, I read everything I could and it didn't make sense to me. Okay. Is the subscription you're selling a that I'm going to buy the local print newspaper? OK, two, two, two totally different things. Okay. So we have a subscription accelerator, which has nothing to do with the subscriptions product that we have out right now. The subscriptions accelerator is working with 12 local news organizations in the US right now. And we are identifying problems that they want to solve and bringing on coaches and other experts to help them solve that over the next three months. Separately, we have a subscription product that's an alpha on iOS and Android. So for publishers who do want to try to sell subscriptions through instant articles, in addition to those who already sell on their own websites, they can do that. And with that model, 100% of the revenue, customer data, the whole transaction is a part of the publisher's site because that was one of the really important requirements. We want to enable direct relationships between publishers and their audiences. So it's not putting lo local news behind a paywall on Facebook? No, we have some local news organizations who are participating in the subscriptions alpha. But that's because for them, it's really important that they figure out how to improve conversions and retention. And we're working to understand best practices with them. But the accelerator is a separate program meant to understand how we can solve larger problems around subscriptions at the local level. So, so one of the things I think that maybe the, the, the world we now live in makes this a sidebar question, but I've noticed a lot of feeds in my feed, of articles in my feed are now increasingly showing up behind a paywall. So it used to right. just be the Wall Street Journal. Right, right. And people share it, and it looks like it's got a headline, I want to click on it, I click it, whoop, okay, I'm not a subscriber. That starts to be a problem for Facebook if three out of 10 That's times true. I can't get the thing that you're presenting to me as if I can get it, which would be one reason to get out of the news business. Well, or, or conversely, Facebook's got my credit card number. When I hit the Seattle Times paywall, Sentiment. take 10 cents out. Yep. And don't ever, you know, just frictionless. Facebook could help with that. And I, I, that's is, not that it, something that's on the table. Uh, uh, is micropayments? Yeah. A conversation? I, I'll be honest, in asking publishers, that's not what they want. We worked on this model directly with publishers, that's and they said the idea of unbundling our model and micropayments yeah. is not something that we're interested in. Yeah. It really devalues their own product. And they also wanted to make sure that they could own 100% of the revenue, the transaction itself, and the customer data. Um, so that was an, we built the requirements based on the conversations with publishers through our Facebook journalism project. I mean, I mean to be fair, the music business didn't want to sell singles either, and Jobs just <laughs> right. elbowed them out of the well, way. Well, I, I thought it was interesting this week, face, the, the AP expanded its partnership with Facebook on fact-checking and said it's going to work in all 50 states to fact-check lies related to the midterm elections. And Facebook's paying, the, I mean, according to Facebook PR, Facebook's paying directly to the AP for that. And I guess I think to myself, you're in the news business now, right? You're a news company if you're, if you're paying for fact-checking. Is, well, is that a fair? Is this the platform versus publisher question? Yeah, it probably is. I, I just think that a binary, are you or are you not a news company, is not a very productive way to be framing the conversation. I think for us, it's about our responsibility. And what we've said is our responsibility is to minimize the bad and get rid of misinformation, false news, clickbait hoaxes. That's where fact checking is incredibly important. If we can invest in that and that helps improve the situation, we will. And on the other side, it's about promoting quality. And so we're looking at a bunch of different levers and ways that we can do that. Um, so again, I, I think we have a long ways to go. It's a tough problem. But for us, we want to make sure that we can do right by that responsibility as opposed to label ourselves as a specific type of company. All right, so one more product that gets sure. kicked around. So we all know that text is dead. And Why? video, I'm kidding. I'm, <laughs> sorry, sarcasm, sarcasm. But, okay. but did everyone, video, pivoting the video, 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 video. Yeah. So mm, I don't know about that. I'm not suggesting, I'm, I'm, it's, we'll get to the end of the premise in a second. So the, so, Moving news to watch, to Facebook Watch. First of all, I'm not sure a lot of people know what Watch is, but what is the news on Watch project? Where is it? Is it is it going to be the better solution to this? How does it work? Yeah. So. 
just to fill everyone in, we have a second tab called Watch, um, which has shows, which is more of a kind of repeatable, retentive viewing experience um, for longer form video. And Campbell Brown uh, just last month announced that we're going to include more news in Watch. And the truth is we're actually still figuring out exactly what that should look like. We're talking to a lot of publishers. Uh, we want to make sure that we understand the use case, how to help create more meaningful relationships between publishers and their audiences. There are a lot of different things that we're exploring. We just don't have the details yet. But I would think of it as something that is an additional moment for publishers to build relationships with their audiences beyond what we're trying to do in Newsfeed. So a lot of what it is is about helping make sure that the discovery of quality news is better. Uh, for video, that happens in Newsfeed. For a place to consume longer form content, that could theoretically and should happen in Watch. We just have to make sure that we can set it up in a way that's truly valuable to high quality publishers. And then there are other surfaces and other products around local groups and kind of community-based moments where we also think we can do a lot and where video can and should play a role. But it's still a little bit too early to talk about the specifics. We're really working through them right now. So I, I think given the brain power we have on this stage and the issue that's floating in the air, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about the midterms. Yeah. Um, so let's just start with the obvious question. Uh, Russian trolls and fake news, problem solved. We've figured out how to tag them and they're done, or we're like losing sleep over it right now? Um, I, I would say we've, we've got our work cut out for us, but actions probably speak louder than words, and we're making some good progress. I mean, there unfortunately is no silver bullet. We are working uh, with some very sophisticated foreign states who are trying to intervene in pretty extreme and, and interesting ways. Um, but if we actually look at what happened last year in 2017, uh, elections in France, uh, in Germany, and Italy, uh, there was a lot that we were able to learn from the 2016 elections that we were able to apply forward, removing fake accounts, bots, viral hoaxes, and other things that actually helped preserve the integrity of those elections. So we are really, I mean, more than tripling and quadrupling down on that investment, uh, but there is no silver bullet. So everything we do around removing any financial disincentives continues to be important. Again, removal of fake accounts, uh, making sure that on the ads transparency side, a lot of what was announced uh, late last year is rolled out in a timely fashion. These are all really important efforts. Uh, but we have a lot to do, and we are really invested and committed to this. It's deeply important. So, Brian, you're smart. You seem to understand ah. these things. Like, are, are the Republicans just building better bots than Democrats? The Re I can't understand. Are the Russians just wanting to mess everything up? They seem to be on all sides of all issues. Like, where, where does this bot feeds to the social network problem? Like, can, is there a root to that, or...? I'm going to plead ignorance on the bot wars a little bit. <laughs> uh, I, I think the, the U.S. government has made clear they wanted to, the Russians wanted to sow division and chaos by playing both sides in some cases, while also expressing a support for, for the Republican candidate in 2016. But going back to it gets worse before it gets better, I, I think we have to take that approach. And I, I like, Alex, I like that you said, we've got, our work for, we've got our work cut out for us. I think that's true for newsrooms as well. This is a space where Facebook and the, new, and the, and the publishers are, are, are aligned. Uh, to try to clean up the poison uh, that, that is so prevalent on the web. You look at Parkland, you look at some of the conspiracy theories that spread. It doesn't take Russian bots uh, to do damage. Sometimes it's our own neighbors that are doing that kind of damage. And I think that's a, that's a space for platforms and publishers to work together. I mean, I think that the danger for 2018 and moving forward is that fake news is evolving. Right. It used to be, especially during 2016, that bad actors sought to sow discord or make money. We saw troll farms in Florida that were producing uh, stories on the right and the left just to gain the system, get engagement, get ad revenue. Um, but they were doing it through stories. Then if you took a look at like Pew polling, it said most Americans can identify a fake story. They know what a fake URL looks like. They know when it's not the same tone of the New York Times or CNN or Axios. The problem is that the public and many of these companies don't know what a doctored photo is or a doctored video is like or what happens when you manipulate a headline. This is the future of fake news that should be most concerning for 2018. I think we've kind of figured out how to squash some of the financially driven fake news stories in Facebook and other platforms. It's the way that we are going to manipulate real news that's the next big threat. And I think, uh, quite frankly, there's a lot that can be done to combat this through machine learning and AI. But 
technology is always going to be there for bad actors to abuse, and getting ahead of it is going to always be our biggest challenge. So, so I have to tell you, I did a TED talk about fake news, and one of the things that I believe really strongly is that people have to take responsibility for what they share, and at least once a day, someone who's a friend of mine will republish something that I check and find out is absolutely fa fake. And sometimes they'll take it down, but as often as not, they'll say to me, people can tell. Like, or it's, it's a parody, or it's satire, or I, and I'm like, no, take it down. When you find out it's fake, don't replicate it. But I do think that there is not an understanding of the seriousness of what happened. It isn't the first piece of fake news that's the problem. It's when someone you trust repeats it, and they repeat it. Yeah, but Facebook made a choice to allow you to post that link to your wall. That's a fundamental choice. And, how, right? How, how could they stop it? I, they have, how could they stop it? They run the software, they run the code. If they didn't want you to post that link, you wouldn't be able to post that link. I'm just pointing out that there are I, I'm fundamental gonna, I'm, I'm gonna let Alex answer that because I'm not I understand, understand that y'all aren't gonna go into that. I understand what? that Facebook is all about posting whatever you want. But let's just recognize that the, the software, it, it, you're talking about virality, you're talking about a fake story being spread by lots and lots of people. Well, they're doing that using these sites. Let's just recognize that up front. That's a choice we've all made as a society well, to allow that. So let's say that the first article is a satire. Sure. And then it gets repeated, but they, the person who re links it changes the headline for their own friends and, and makes it less clear that it's a satire. And then it gets repeated again. I'm not sure where along the way Facebook should stop. I, I agree. I think it's incredibly complicated. It's too complicated <laughs> to address here. All right. Let me give you the best example that's affected me. I had a fake story written about me. The first paragraph was real quotes. The rest was fake quotes. I hardly knew what was real and what was fake. I had a hard time telling the difference. And, and I can't wow. expect an algorithm or a Facebook uh, uh, a moderator to know the difference. It is going to get a lot worse. But I, I just want us to recognize that we've, we've, we've all bought into this by using these sites. I think it goes back to what you said about user responsibility, triple checking before we all share content on any of these social networks. And go, going back to sort of like, you know, user and consumer expectations, in the United States, consumer expectations to, quite frankly, even data privacy, true news, are a lot lower than other places around the world. I mean, mm -hmm. if you take a look at what's happening in Europe, there's such a approach being happening there that people really are fighting um, for true news, for no terrorism on their platforms, for, um, you know, data privacy in a way that we're just not doing here. I even thought exactly. after Russia, a third of Americans were exposed to Russian propaganda on Facebook. Half of Americans were affected by Equifax. I expected this to be the year that Americans woke up and said, we need to do something about this. But if you take a look at polling, if you take a look at consumer sentiment, yes, there's a little bit more awareness around the big dangers of big tech, but it's not anywhere near the point that you would think consumers are going to be riled up enough about it to call out their neighbor for posting a fake link. So what is going to wake people up? And will anything wake people up? My point about posting links and that Facebook allows you to post anything, even a lie, I understand we've all opted into that environment. My point is that we should think big about these issues. A lot of the conversations around misinformation, they're, they're small. They're about putting a flag up so you know something might be disputed. We should have a big conversation about the government's regulatory role with these companies, these giant companies. And we should have a conversation about uh, what we're teaching in classrooms about this as well. This is a society, you know, there are societal problems here. I, I, I would argue we are having these conversations though. Like these conversations are happening. I think the regulatory piece is a little bit, I'm gonna put that to aside for a second. I, I mean, yeah. from our present. No. <laughs> no, but like, we'll get we, back to it. But I was gonna well, say, no. right now, it, it's on, it's not just about people waking up, it's about us proactively coming together as platforms, as publishers, yeah. as concerned citizens, and figuring out what we can do to arm people with as much useful information so that they do feel like news literacy is not a thing they have to work towards. It's really easy to understand where a news piece, where a new, what a news source looks like, what is high quality, what is good. These are things that we can and need to be doing more of right now. So I don't mean to, like again, make light of regulation. I think that's another really important, interesting topic. But I don't think that this is a conversation that is not being had. I think, if anything, we need to do more to make sure that we have the same ultimate end goal here. It's not like we are in direct competition. It's quite the opposite. Well, we are in direct competition for ad dollars, though. I mean, and for attention and time. So we're there running, is direct competition. So, but we so, should then talk a little bit more about what we're trying to do about that. All right, because, wait, so, yeah. which is where we're going. Okay. So okay. we're okay. going to have time for Q&A. So like, we'll have a microphone. How are we going to do that? So is there a place where people can line up? Yeah. But before we do that, 
last question and the one that I promised I would ask because I think it's important. Yeah. We spent a lot of time looking in the rearview mirror about what happened badly in the last year. Yeah. Talk a little bit about where things are going. What are the things you're working on that you think are going to take Facebook in a good direction? The big thing is, yeah, so I mean, if I, if I try to judge whether or not we're successful by the end of the year, I think there are a couple of things. Um, first, even if the overall volume of news is going down on Facebook, we would need to radically mix shift so that the news that people see whenever they do see it is high quality. That's number one. Two, we need to make sure that they actually understand what quality looks like. So it's one thing to have ranking changes happen on the back end. It's another thing to make sure that people really internalize and understand that. The second, or sorry, the third, I think, is making sure that we're not only thinking about Facebook as a way to create distribution and reach for publishers, but it's increasingly about meaningful relationships. So it's not about indiscriminate volume, it's really about publishers having a way to identify audiences that are going to want to engage with their brand. And there are a lot of products through instant articles, through groups, eventually through Watch, through this local product, we're really trying to give as many lovers as possible to publishers to deepen that relationship down the funnel. And then I think the last big thing is having a diversified set of products to make sure that publishers, and especially high quality publishers, can derive the type of value that they want to see from Facebook. And so right now we're really relying on advertising within instant articles. Uh, right now we're paying about a million and a half dollars per day. We've seen a 100% increase in ad yield. It's not necessarily enough, but it's a start. And then subscriptions. This is one of the biggest investments for us from a product perspective. We really want to make sure that we can get it right and then extend to more variations and models uh, because it's really important that people understand that paying for quality news on or off Facebook is very important and that we're doing our part to help facilitate that. Okay. So, our first question right here. Hi. I think so. Hi. Yeah. Hello. Go, go ahead. We got you. Hey, first time here. Uh, can you tell us how Facebook, Facebook is working with Latin American media? Because I don't see, uh, I don't feel actually a close relationship with us. I'm from Peru, actually. Sure. Thank you for the question. And sorry, uh, which news organization are you with? <laughs> sorry. Sorry. Andina News Agency from Peru. Okay, great. I, I think it's a, it's a really good question. So I. Um, one of my other, I guess, wishes for this year um, is that we be much less US-centric and US-focused in the way that we build products. Um, and so right now, a lot of our products and our early tests are in the US and in Western Europe. And to your point, that's not enough. So this year is also a year where we are spending much more time in Latin America um, and in APAC and in India. Uh, because we know that there are a lot of regional differences and we need to do better. So if anything, I would say look for the end of this year and hold us accountable to see if we've actually helped solve for some of the problems that you're facing. It's a little hard to see. Yeah, sorry. Oh, see the microphone going that way? Hey. Yes, right Hi, there. thanks. I'm Nimrod from the UK. You keep calling uh, Mr. Zuckerberg Mark. I'll call him Mr. Zuckerberg. <laughs> I don't know him. Why do you keep <laughs> sure. calling him Mark? Like, what if he just changes his mind? He changed his mind in 2018, saying like things happen. We, there's no regulation, as Mr. Stelter said. What if he just one day wakes up, he's got so much power, changes his mind, he doesn't care anymore about reg regulating news. Uh, and sorry, the worry is that he doesn't care about news? What if he changes his mind one morning, Mr. Zuckerberg, and he just doesn't care anymore about the topic at all? He doesn't care anymore. About the news topic specifically? Yeah. yeah, so I mean, if we actually want to play this out, let's say, just theoretically, Mark decided, you know what, my life would be so much easier. I would avoid congressional hearings if <laughs> I just removed all of news from Facebook. We're still waiting for him to show up to a congressional hearing, by the way. <laughs> um, I think if you actually play through what that means, and I, I, do, I, I don't want to joke about this because it's a really important point. Yeah. Um, the idea that, especially outside of the US, in markets where people don't necessarily have access to free speech and information, the idea of restricting that because we think that we cannot solve for some of these problems is quite honestly against our mission and our ethos. So the idea that Facebook would play a part in censorship is unacceptable, and so we are not backing away from news. If anything, I think it's a pretty big signal that the, announcement that the announcements that did take place at the beginning of the year were all about our commitment and having a point of view on the type of news that we do think we need to support on Facebook. Um, I actually think, and this is something that energizes me and my team a lot, it's actually really exciting to have a mission around news that is not only internal facing, but also external facing. I think that this will actually provide more stability for 
the product managers and the engineers working on products, but also more importantly for publishers so that they have a better sense of what to expect over this year. And this is really kind of this effort for us to reset the tone and the expectations with the publishing industry. We are trying to be increasingly collaborative and increasingly transparent. Um, and I think that that's why when we say putting all of your eggs in the Facebook basket is probably not the right thing to do, we mean it. We can be one important part of your strategy, but we should not be the only part of your business going forward. Uh, I'm from Brazil, from a media vehicle down there, and uh, my mom shares a lot of fake news on Facebook. <laughs> and, uh, Have you talked to her about that? Yeah, I did, but she, she just loves it. Uh, <laughs> how, how, is this, how is this algorithm change good for this issue? I mean, I see a lot of Facebook, I see a lot of fake news because my mom shares it, and I don't see a lot of real news because the algorithm tells me that my friends and family relations are more important than trusted news publishers. So, isn't, that a, isn't this a contradiction? I mean, you are saying that Facebook is working to put more real news on the feed, but you are prioritizing my mom, who <laughs> shares a lot of fake news. <laughs> have, you so, so have, it's, you, it's a really have you considered unfriending your mom? <laughs> Don't I did last year, but she didn't invite me to Christmas party. <laughs> yeah. So, so, just in terms of uh, the high quality principles that we've announced, um, they have rolled out in the U.S. They have not rolled out internationally, and we're working to do that as fast, but also as thoughtfully as we can. So, a couple of things. First, the only reason why you would see any news in your newsfeed is because you follow a page or someone within your friend network is sharing that. Once we actually can roll out some ranking changes that give trusted, informative, kind of local content much more visibility within your feed and downrank other news that is lower quality, that's when you should actually see that change occur. So if you follow a page from, just making this up, say Globo or some other kind of really great news organization um, that does follow that criteria, you should be seeing them higher up in feed technically, but um, we just haven't rolled it out yet to Latin America, which is part of, part of why you're probably not seeing a change. But you should soon. I mean, this is one of our biggest efforts this year. Uh, we just need to be very thoughtful about how we identify news sources based on these principles and how we roll out the changes so that, again, they are done in a methodical and objective and non-gameable way. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Where did our mic go? Right here. Over here. Oh, okay, go ahead. Alex. Hi. I, your talk, the way I'm hearing describe the relationship publisher is moving on is just as another advertiser. Uh, we have multiple products that you can use to get people further down your funnel uh, to identify your brand. <sighs> Facebook's built itself on this pixel that you've got deployed on every brand site around the country, on every publisher site. Are you working with publishers to give us better access to the data that you're amassing in that pixel. Can you just say who you're with? Uh, Josh Rubin with The Daily Dot. Yeah, so, so the, the products that we're working on with publishers specifically, um, there, there are a couple of different things. Um, I think one of the most interesting, and maybe this is where the pixel comes in, um, is the idea of cross-platform insights, because that is actually one of the best tools to help publishers decide whether or not they even want to invest in Facebook. Uh, and so that's something that we have rolled out uh, to a set of alpha partners, and we do want to make uh, available to more partners soon. Because then you basically as a publisher know what your audience looks like on your own property, on Facebook, what the overlap looks like, and whether or not you actually want to invest. And that is actually, I think, one of the best ways for publishers to make a decision about what they want to do. Um, there are a bunch of other tools around access, control, and transparency that we're working on as well, uh, especially in feed, so that hopefully over the course of the year, publishers have a better sense of how their organic content is performing and what they can do to make sure that their content strategies and even the type of content that they seed into Facebook is yielding the type of results that they want. Um, so I hope that answers your question. I mean, there, data is, there's so many different ways to slice and dice, but if there's a specific product, find me after and I'd be happy to talk to you. Thanks. All right, we have time for one more. Oh, no pressure. Yeah. Last person. Right here. Hi there. Um, I'm actually now uh, Lance Yulonov, an independent journalist. But um, uh, can you say that Facebook, Alex, in the future, will no longer try to steer publishers towards the type of content that they believe will work for audiences? Uh, I'm just wondering about the discussions that happened after the sort of 
the li Facebook Live meltdown, where Facebook was paying publishers to do a lot of video content every month, pushing them really hard, ta literally changing strategy every single day. But you keep talking about helping publishers understand the kinds of content that will work with audiences. But are you finished telling publishers the kind of content they must do to work with Facebook? Yeah, I, I, I think when I look at this year, uh, we want to make sure that publishers have more visibility into how their content is performing and that we're being a partner to help figure out the products that they want to see wrapped around their content on Facebook. So I don't think it's about us having a bunch of let's say, the next five versions of Facebook Live, uh, we're really looking for longer term, more sustainable products where publishers are increasingly in control of what they distribute and how they monetize it. Um, I don't have a specific product kind of in mind to point to from that perspective, but I think we're really trying to enter an era of, um, quite honestly, like long term viability as opposed to a bunch of quick hits from an, exper an experimentation perspective. That said, we do experiment a lot with publishers. We just want to be very clear about sometimes the nascency of these experiments. And we find that some publishers are very eager to get on board and try, and other publishers prefer to take a wait and see approach. And that's totally fine. We just want to make sure that we're increasingly transparent about the process. So we are out of time. I have two very important closing thoughts. One, Sarah's newsletter every week is fabulous. You should subscribe to it. Brian's daily newsletter is also fabulous. You should subscribe to okay. that as well. <laughs> They're focused and thoughtful and thank pithy you. and consumable, and they will make you smarter. <laughs> I want to thank, thank Facebook for coming and for Alex for sharing the time, and I think the next year is going to be really important and exciting. Thank, thank you, you all very, very much. Thank you. Thank you.